you very much. And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the most important issue facing Scotland is and how does she think spending months debating independence will help it? First Minister. Well, I think growing our economy so that we are creating the wealth and the revenues to support the strong National Health Service, the strong education system, the strong public services that I know the Tories don't support is the most important challenge that Scotland faces. Across all of these things, this is a government using its powers and its resources to best effect to make as much progress as we can. But we are determined to do even better. And I think the hard fact for unionist parties across this chamber is that small independent countries across the world consistently do better than the UK and then Scotland within the UK. So the positive debate that we look forward to leading is how Scotland raises its game even further, matches the best in the world for the benefit of people right across our country. We will do that with our current powers and we will look to equip this parliament so that it is even stronger to deliver on the part of the people we represent. Ruth Davidson. You know, for me, the most important issue is making sure our children get a good education. And the First Minister used to claim that that was her priority too, how times have changed. And it's hard to see how dragging Scotland back down the rabbit hole of a debate on independence is going to improve our schools. Let's take just one area where action has been repeatedly promised by the First Minister, getting more pupils into science, technology and math subjects. These are the subjects that will produce the engineers and the scientists and the programmers of tomorrow's economy. So can the First Minister tell me in which of the key STEM subjects in biology, in physics, in chemistry or in maths are more pupils taking hires than they were at the last independence referendum in 2014? First Minister. Firstly, if Ruth Davidson is serious about education being the most important thing to her and her party, the question for her surely must be why she is a member of a party that is not just paralysed on Brexit, but paralysed by Brexit and doing nothing else besides. On the question of education, uh, we, have set out, we have set out an ambitious package of reform on education that starts by doubling childcare provision in our country, goes through to reforming school education and we'll soon uh, see which of the other parties in this chamber are prepared to back the reform uh, programme that we put together, getting more young people leaving school with more qualifications and as I set out last week we've got more young people leaving our schools with qualifications including hires, including advanced hires across a range of subjects. Yes we want to get more young people studying STEM subjects, that's why we've got a range of initiatives to do exactly that. So we will continue to focus on all of these things, improving our education system uh, and improving it for all pupils, regardless of their background. Ruth Davidson. As an officer, it wasn't a complicated question, but the First Minister still couldn't answer it. And the answer is none. In biology, in physics, in chemistry and in maths, not only are there fewer pupils taking hires, there are fewer people getting hires than back in 2014. And it's a mystery to me how spending months restarting the debate about independence is going to do anything to improve that. But let's go from high schools to primaries, because the SNP used to make bold promises on education about reducing class sizes in primaries one to three to a maximum of 18 pupils. In fact, Mike Russell was once so confident as to claim that the SNP phased implementation programme to reduce class sizes would be completed in seven years. So, after 11 years in government, how many classes in the First Minister's own constituency meet that target? Yep. First Minister. Before, before Ruth Davidson is allowed to move swiftly on from STEM subjects, uh, she asked me uh, about that first of all. So let me... <laughs> let me... She doesn't... She doesn't want to hear the answer. Okay. I hope everybody's listening. In 2017-18, we increased student intake targets for the STEM subjects for the sixth year in a row. Uh, and let's look at uh, STEM qualifications. She asked me about this. STEM qualifications at school 
uh, have gone up from 2007 to 2017 by 9.6%. Uh, that includes uh, all sciences, biology, human biology, chemistry, physics, geology, environmental science. That is the reality. In terms of primary school education, uh, as we have discussed in this chamber before, we are determined not just to improve standards in our schools, but to make sure we're closing the attainment gap in our schools. That's why the attainment fund, the pupil equity fund, is transforming primary education across our uh, education system. And if Ruth Davidson got out a bit more and spoke to more teachers <laughs> around the education system, she would find out that that's exactly what they're saying as well. Ruth Davidson. Well, the First Minister got out a bit more in her own constituency. She might know the answer to the question that I asked her. Out of, out of 91 early years classes in her own Southside constituency... Order, oh, please, order. I'm standing in my constituency. I'm her MSP. Out of 91... And Perhaps the First Minister's backbenchers might want to listen to this. Out of 91, 91 early years classes in her own Southside constituency, the latest figures show just four were small enough to meet the promise that the SNP made more than a decade ago. That's four out of 91. But that's just like the SNP, isn't it? Promises that they made to get elected are abandoned the moment they become inconvenient. Yes. But there is one thing that they are never willing to put aside. Because tomorrow, the First Minister is going to launch yet another blueprint into independence, dragging this country back to the debates of the past. She has repeatedly claimed that education is our number one priority, and so it should be. But the facts show difference. With her, it is independence first, and everything else a long way behind. And the country is asking, why won't she give it a rest? First Minister. Of course. Well, well firstly, I, I'm not sure a comparison of constituency surgeries would end very well uh, for Ruth Davidson. No. Secondly, <laughs> wasn't it ironic that the give it a rest line was first used uh, this week uh, by Ruth Davidson on Monday? Uh, when she boldly said that I, the SNP, should give it a rest on talking about the Constitution. Where did she say this? At a conference in London where she was talking about the Constitution. <laughs> now, some people, some people, presiding officer, might say that that is a tad hypocritical of Ruth Davidson. I, of course, couldn't possibly comment. The truth about Ruth Davidson is she loves nothing more than talking about the Constitution. She just doesn't want the case for independence to get a hearing. Well, I'm sorry that we're going to have to disappoint her on that front. This government will continue to take the action that is required to improve our education system. That's why we're investing £120 million pounds in the Pupil Equity Fund uh, and when I talk to teachers across my constituency that's something they enthusiastically uh, welcome. We will continue to improve our health service with the best performing accident emergency services anywhere in the UK for three years yeah. now. We will continue to protect the vulnerable from the cuts being imposed by the Tories and unlike Ruth Davidson we'll continue to stand up for Scotland against the uh, Brexit ideology of the Tories and get the best deal. We are full of ambition for this country of ours. I know positivity and ambition doesn't sit well with it. What was it Ruth Davidson called them this week? Uh, the doer, joyless, authoritarian Tories. I know they don't like positivity and ambition, but this government does, and we are going to continue to be ambitious for Scotland. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As we've just heard, the long-delayed SNP Growth Commission report is published tomorrow. Now, that might excite the backbenches of the SNP, but it will exasperate the millions of people right across Scotland who just want the First Minister focused on public services like our National Health Service. In 2012, the SNP gave patients the right to treatment within 12 weeks. They named it the Treatment Time Guarantee. Yet in 2015, 
16,394 people waited longer than 12 weeks for treatment. That was Nicola Sturgeon's first full year as First Minister. So can she tell us if the number of patients who were failed last year went up or down? First Minister. Well, because of that treatment time guarantee that we introduced back in 2012, there are, I think, more than one and a half million patients have been treated more quickly because of that guarantee than they would have been uh, without it. Uh, we are investing record sums in our National Health Service. We are employing record numbers of staff uh, working in our National Health Service. We know that the demands on our health service are increasing. That is why there is a pressure on waiting times. But we invest more per head of population than anywhere else in the UK. And we will continue to do that. That, uh, so that our NHS can continue to deliver the services that has so much approval from people across the country. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, I asked if the number went up or down. It went up. Over 54,000 people waited longer than the 12-week guarantee in 2017. That's a 234% increase since Nicola Sturgeon became First Minister. The First Minister tells us that the NHS faces the challenge of treating more patients than ever before. So can I ask her how many more patients were seen under the treatment time guarantee last year compared to her first year in office? First Minister. As I've already said, one and a half million patients, more than that, have been seen within uh, that target time, making sure that they get treated uh, more quickly uh, as a result. There are more patients uh, coming to the NHS because of the ageing population. That is why we are committed, unlike the Labour Party at the last election, uh, to more resources for our National Health Service, to employ more people in our National Health Service, to make sure that patients continue to get the treatment that they deserve. Richard Leonard. Well, in fact, presiding officer, the number of patients seen has gone down. There were 28,000 fewer patients seen in 2017 compared to 2015, and yet more people waited longer. So let's just recap. The SNP promised that people would be treated within 12 weeks. In Nicola Sturgeon's first year, that promise was broken to one patient in every 20. Last year, it was broken to one patient in every five. Presiding officer, this is the fifth time in six weeks that I've raised the NHS with the First Minister. There are serious problems right across the health service, and they are growing. And that's what the people of Scotland want the government to be focused on. Absolutely. Not another referendum, <laughs> not more division. When will the First Minister finally realise that the people want her to put the NHS before the SNP? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government will remain focused on improving our NHS each and every single day. That is why right now in Scotland our emergency services perform better than they do in any other part of the UK. It's why so many of the other services provided by the NHS are better than they are in any other part of the UK, including the only part of the UK where Labour is in government right now, which is of course in Wales. Uh, we're putting record amounts of investment into the National Health Service. We're employing record numbers of people. The NHS is seeing more patients every year and will continue to deliver its services and have the record high patient satisfaction that our NHS currently does. That of course is testament to everybody who works in our NHS and we will continue to support them every single day. Thank you. We've got a few supplementary constituency questions. The first from Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister is aware of the case of my constituent, Deanne Fitzpatrick, about whom I have previously written to her. She cannot be anything other than shocked at the photograph published by the BBC sh showing one aspect of Deanne's abuse. Will the First Minister now intervene investigate the abuse and stop Deanne's persecution at the hands of Marine Scotland? And will she also remove the gagging clause that stops Deanne telling her own story because it's in the public interest that she has heard? First Minister. Well, like 
everyone else who has seen it, I am absolutely horrified at the photograph uh, that has been in the media over the past 24 hours. Uh, and I'm also horrified at the circumstances in which that photograph is alleged to have been taken. Uh, bullying, abuse, sexism, racism have no place in any workplace and let me be very clear today, they will not be tolerated within the Scottish Government uh, or within our agencies. Uh, there is of course, as the member is aware, an ongoing employment tribunal, there's also a, an ongoing internal investigation, so I am uh, somewhat limited in what I can say, but I can tell the Chamber that I have this morning uh, asked the Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government to conduct a full review of the circumstances of this case, uh, a review of the action that has already been taken and of any action proposed to be taken and to report to me personally on her conclusions as soon as possible. A question from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, Edinburgh Woolen Mill announced plans to move their headquarters to Carlisle in a bitter blow to Langham, where the company was founded. This news is doubly disappointing because it comes as uncertainty continues at Pinnies. Can the First Minister confirm what contact the Government have had with Edinburgh Woolen Mill and set out what support is being offered to boost the economy in Lower Annandale and Estale, which is clearly struggling? First Minister. Well, firstly, I am very disappointed to hear that Edinburgh Woolen Mill have confirmed plans to move their head office from Langholm. Uh, the company's plans, unfortunately, do seem to be fairly well developed, but uh, notwithstanding that, we will do all we can to encourage a different course of action to retain jobs and economic benefit in the town and community, uh, and importantly, the company's HQ in Scotland. Uh, I can tell the member that the business minister is speaking to the company today to see what support the Scottish Government and our agencies can offer. We've also already offered support through our Partnership Action for Continuing Employment Initiative for any employees who may be facing redundancy. And I know the business minister would be happy to speak to Mr Mundell uh, more in detail uh, about the actions uh, we can and will take. Take. In terms of the wider question, as the member will be aware, we are committed to establishing the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. And in advance of that, we've established the South of Scotland Economic Partnership, which is supported by £10 million of additional resources. And when I attended the National Economic Forum in Dumfries just last week, uh, that was something that was very uh, warmly welcomed and ho hopefully will support economic activity across the South of Scotland. Bob Doris. Um, First Minister, a constituent of mine underwent surgery in 2015 at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, was readmitted twice with serious post-surgical complications and has lasting health issues. She has serious concerns over treatment received and of the ensuing NHS complaints process. Now, I welcome the Health Secretary's requested Healthcare Improvement Scotland to independently review the care received. However, does the First Minister agree with me that the first action in these cases that Healthcare Improvement Scotland should take is to meet the family? and carefully listen to their experience. And furthermore, does she agree it's unacceptable that following my representations to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde regarding inaccuracies in medical records and alleged system failure, that two months later, we're still waiting for a response? First Minister. Uh, well, yes, I uh, definitely understand the concerns that Bob Doris has raised. I also uh, agree that it is important that the experiences of uh, the individual and the family are uh, listened to. Uh, as Bob Doris has indicated, I know he has uh, raised the concerns of uh, his constituent with the Health Secretary directly. She has recently referred the case to Healthcare Improvement Scotland for their considerations. Scottish Government officials have also raised with NHS Chief Executives the Health Secretary's expectation uh, that they should be responding quickly to any concerns raised by either elected representatives or individuals. Uh, we want everybody to be confident that they will get the best possible care and treatment from the NHS and it does an excellent job in the overwhelming majority of cases. But on any occasion where it falls short of expectations, health boards must listen and they must act. And in rare cases of clinical negligence, uh, boards and care professionals must learn from these situations and make improvements. So I know the Health Secretary uh, will update uh, Bob Doris uh, as appropriate and uh, take whatever steps necessary to ensure that his constituents' concerns are properly addressed. And Monica Lennon. Thank you. Marks and Spencer has announced it will close the Falkirk and East Kilbride Plaza stores in the central Scotland region. I know the First Minister pays close attention to the activities of MS and will share my concerns for the workforce and communities who will suffer from this decision. 
Over five weeks ago, I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, Keith Brown, to outline my fears for the future of East Kilbride Town Centre and to ask if this government has a strategy to ensure Scotland's first new town has a bright future. I'm still waiting for an answer. Can I ask the First Minister if she knows the answer and if she will ask the Cabinet Secretary to take up my invitation to visit East Kilbride and meet with local businesses before any more devastating job losses are announced? First Minister. Well, firstly, of course, Marks and Spencer uh, announced uh, the closure of uh, a number of shops, not just in Scotland, but throughout the UK over the next four years. That is deeply uh, regrettable. Uh, I'm certainly very concerned uh, about the announcement to close uh, two of <laughs> its stores in Scotland, East Kilbride and Falkirk. Uh, we have been in contact with the company to offer support uh, through PACE and also any other the support that might be appropriate. Uh, I will certainly ask uh, Keith Brown uh, to respond to the member. I'm sure he's visited East Kilbride on many uh, occasions. I personally grew up in a new town. I know the importance of new towns uh, to our country, to the economy of our country, and in a wider sense as well. We want to see new towns uh, continue to be central to the future of Scotland, and I'm sure Keith Brown would be happy to discuss these issues uh, further uh, with Monica Lennon. We, uh, of course, uh, are already working with partners to deliver against uh, the themes in the Town Centre Action Plan uh, and have already committed to the Town Centre First Principle, which is a very important way of making sure that our ten centres, whether they're in new towns uh, or elsewhere, are properly supported. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Nearly a decade ago, the Greens worked with others across Parliament and many, many thousands of campaigners across Scotland to say that the government's climate change bill, as it was then, wasn't strong enough, wasn't bold enough, and together we pushed a minority government to make that bill stronger and accelerate action on climate change. Why then has the government today published a new climate change bill which sets out slower emission reductions, slower progress for the next 20 years than we've seen for the last 10? And why on earth should Parliament vote for that? First Minister. I think Patrick Harvey is just wrong in his characterisation of the climate change bill published today. Uh, what has been published today is the most ambitious statutory target for reducing carbon emissions anywhere in the world. Uh, the bill sets a 90% reduction by 2050, which let's remember uh, the Committee on Climate Change says is at the outer limits of feasibility. But the bill also sets out a very clear process uh, for raising that to 100% as soon as practically possible. Now, other countries are often cited as being more ambitious. But as I'm sure Patrick Harvey knows, uh, when we compare commitments on a like-for-like -like basis, that's simply not the case. If you take Sweden, for example, uh, which is often held up as already having a 100% target, Sweden reserves the right to achieve 15% of its reduction through international credits. In other words, by paying other countries. Uh, Scotland's target will require to be met by domestic measures yeah. alone, yeah. which is much, much tougher. Other countries uh, also exclude aviation and shipping from their targets. We don't. Uh, Scotland continues to be the only country that includes aviation and shipping. And as well as our long-term uh, targets, Scotland, unlike other countries, also sets uh, annual targets in legislation. Uh, so when you look at all of these factors, it is inescapably the case that this bill published today is the most ambitious anywhere in the world. We should be proud of that, but of course we look forward to the discussions that will take place uh, during the parliamentary progress of that bill. Patrick Harvey. It is abundantly clear that the 2050 target that the Scottish Government is proposing represents a slower rate of emissions cuts, a slower rate of progress on climate change than we have seen for the last 10 years. And it takes some nerve, it really does take some nerve to publish, it takes some nerve, presiding officer, to publish a bill, the first section of which is titled the net zero emissions target and then fails to set a net zero emissions target. The First Minister tells us about Sweden and what we should all know about Sweden. Well, I know that if Sweden counted their forestry and land use emissions in the same way that we do in Scotland, they'd reach net zero by 2045. 2045, way ahead of the Scottish Government's ambition. Isn't it clear, presiding officer, not just to all of us in Parliament, 
but to the many, many thousands of people across Scotland who care passionately, passionately about the urgent challenge of climate change, that we are once again going to have to work together across the political spectrum and with the many, many thousands of campaigners in Scotland to push a minority government beyond its comfort zone on this issue. First Minister. Uh, actually, putting a target in legislation that our expert advisers, the Committee on Climate Change, describes as that the outer limits of feasibility can be described in many ways, but staying within a comfort zone is really no, not uh, one of them. Uh, if we were to do what Patrick Harvey is asking us to do right now, let me be clear, uh, we are committed to reaching net zero uh, as quickly as we can look the people of Scotland in the eye and say that we know how we can do that. Uh, we can put a target in legislation, but I don't think that would be particularly honest if what we're saying to uh, the people of Scotland is we've got no idea right now how that can be uh, achieved. So what Patrick Harvey is asking us to do is to ignore the Committee on Climate Change. He would be asking us, if he's asking us to emulate other countries, to exclude shipping and aviation from our targets. And if he's asking us to emulate other countries like Sweden, he would be asking us uh, to include international credits in the calculation of our achievement uh, against targets. Sweden uh, reserves the right to achieve 15% of its own reduction through effectively not what it does itself, but by paying other countries to do it. Uh, we think it's better actually to meet our targets by the things we do here domestically in Scotland. So let's have the debate as this bill progresses through Parliament. But for goodness sake, Scotland is leading the world in our ambitions to tackle climate change, not just in our ambitions to tackle climate change, but in our achievements when it comes to tackling climate change. And for goodness sake, I would have thought a member of the Green Party might actually manage to welcome that. Some further supplementaries. The first one, Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest. The BME this week said there was absolutely no clarity on future plans for immigration and that virtually no progress had been made to allow medical professionals to come and work in Scotland after Brexit. No clarity and no progress. How will the First Minister continue to impress on the UK Government that this situation is simply no use? First Minister. Well, this is a really serious situation and I hope everybody across this chamber recognises that. We have companies the length and breadth of the country expressing concerns about their ability to continue to retain and attract talent. And now we have the BMA expressing concerns about the ability of our NHS to attract doctors uh, from other countries. And this is all because uh, of the ideologically driven Brexit obsession of the Tories. And that is why we do need as a country to look at better alternatives. It's why we need to continue to argue for a common sense approach, but also to consider what it is we need as a country to attract the best and the brightest across the world to come here to make a contribution to Scotland. And that is what this government uh, will continue to focus on. And I hope we will have the support, if not of the Tories, then of other parties across this chamber. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A number of my constituents in Rutherglen and Canvas Lang receive palliative care at the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice in Glasgow. The NHS, after limited consultation, planned to move these patients to a different facility in East Kilbride. Those who support the facility, their families, and the GPs who support the patients locally are understandably concerned about this change. What assurances can the First Minister give my constituents that any changes made are done in the best interests of those affected? First Minister. Well, firstly, I am a huge supporter of the work that the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice uh, does. It's a, a hospice I've visited on many occasions in the past, and I know how highly valued it is uh, by patients and by their families. In terms of the specific issue that James uh, Kelly raises, I will ask the, the Health Secretary to look into that specifically uh, to understand the reasons that the Health Board have taken uh, the decision which has been uh, described by James Kelly today uh, and ask the Health Secretary to reply to him as soon as possible. Question number four, Richard Lockett. Can I ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of how any proposed post-Brexit trade deal with the United States could impact on the Scotch whisky sector? First Minister. Uh, the United States is the largest export market for Scotch whisky. It's worth uh, £922 million uh, in 2017 and accounts for over 20% of all Scotch whisky exports. 
Uh, Scotch whisky industry also employs around uh, 10,000 full-time equivalent employees with a similar number employed in the wider supply chain. It makes an important contribution to our economy, particularly in Richard Lockhead's constituency. Uh, the Scottish Government and I believe the Scotch Whisky Association are opposed to any weakening of the whisky definition post-Brexit as a result of trade negotiations with third countries or via any other means. Uh, this protection is vital to protect both consumers and industry from uh, deception and unfair competition with domestically produced spirit drinks uh, that have no age provenance. Richard Lockhead. Can I begin by inviting the First Minister to join me in congratulating the Edrington Group on investing £500 million in the Macallan, including £140 million in the truly spectacular distillery and visitor centre unveiled in Speyside this week. And does she agree that that massive investment with others across the industry underlines the need to protect, protect this valuable industry and ensure it's not damaged by increasingly desperate UK government that may sign up to a damaging post-Brexit trade deal with the United States, who it's been reported would like to break down trade barriers and reduce protections for the likes of Scotch whisky. And can she advise the Chamber of how we can bring more transparency to these trade deal negotiations uh, and ensure that they are acting in Scotland's interests, not against Scotland's interests? And is it possible for the Scottish Government to perhaps have observers at these trade negotiations to safeguard our key economic interests in this country? First Minister. <laughs> well, firstly, I... I very much welcome the development by Edrington at Craigallachie. Uh, more than half a billion pounds of investment has gone into industry sites in the last five years, with seven new distilleries opening in the last year alone. Uh, that is hugely positive, and I'm sure everybody uh, welcomes that. Only yesterday, uh, the Scotch Whisky Association reported that without Scotch Whisky's export performance, the UK trade deficit would be almost 3% greater than it already is. Uh, where there is significant interest to the Scottish economy, it's absolutely vital, and I would hope everybody would agree with this, that the Scottish Government is actively involved at all stages of the process of future trade deals, uh, including as members or, or observers of the negotiating uh, team, because only in this way will the UK Government's stated aim of a trade policy to reflect the interests of all parts of the UK become a, a reality. Uh, issues like this, I think, also underline why it's so important that this Parliament does not give its consent to a power grab uh, on the powers of this Parliament that will be so important to protecting these interests in the future. Uh, so I hope we will have the support of all parties across this chamber uh, when we do our very best to make sure that Scotland's interests are heard loudly and clearly in any future negotiations. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Whisky exporters to the United States are now facing massive currency uncertainty as a result of the First Minister once again calling into question Scotland's future currency. Order, please. Order, please. Let's hear the question. Let's hear the question, please. Can the First Minister explain to Scotch whisky exporters what her latest currency plans involve, or, like some of her colleagues, is she not a currency expert? First Minister. But, you know, e even the Tory front bench had the good grace to look embarrassed while the member was asking <laughs> that question. I have to break it. I, I have to break it to him. That's not the issue uh, that people in the whisky industry are raising with me. Let me tell you uh, the issues that have been raised with me, and I'm afraid they are about Brexit. The whisky industry is worried about potential trade barriers. They're worried about the kind of thing we've just been talking about, uh, possible damage to the protection of Scotch whisky. Uh, they're worried about their ability to continue to have the export success that is so important to the trade balance of the UK. If the member perhaps spoke to more people uh, in the whisky industry, perhaps he would know that and not embarrass himself by asking the question he just has. Question five, Annie Wells. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that nearly £4 million is being spent on sending x-rays, CT and MRI scans to radiologists out with Scotland. First Minister. Well, high quality, safe services uh, to patients is an absolute priority and our radiology staff do an excellent job. To ensure that scans are seen quickly by qualified professionals is an option 
for NHS boards to utilise the services of radiologists out with Scotland. This allows them to ensure that they direct their local capacity to treat patients. Uh, this is not unique to Scotland. It's also a method that is used by the NHS in England and the NHS in Wales. But of course, to help grow local capacity, we're investing £4 million in a radiology transformation programme to improve capacity across Scotland. Annie Wills. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The £3.8 million spent on outsourcing radiology services between April 2017 and February 2018 is up by an astonishing 35% from the previous year. And the cause, the cause of this is clear. There is a serious shortage of radiologists in Scotland. The latest stats show that one in seven posts are vacant. I understand that the First Minister has said she's investing £4 million in new, uh, new, new services. But can the First Minister... Um, confirmed to me that the that how that sorry can the first minister confirm to me that the backlogs of radiology work will, and the and how to fill the posts that are vacant will be ensured by health board spending less money first minister well Firstly, I think for a, a Tory to stand up here and talk about vacancies in the NHS after we've just been talking about the concerns raised by the BME about being able to attract people into our NHS really does take uh, the biscuit. Uh, secondly, the, the £4 million investment that she talks about, let me just firstly put that into some context. That represents 0.03% of health resource spending. But the more fundamental point I want to make is this one, because I think uh, with the greatest of respect to Annie Wells, I think she perhaps uh, misunderstands slightly uh, the, the issue around uh, radiology scans. Uh, Utilising diagnostic uh, imaging assessment services to ensure that scans are seen uh, as quickly uh, as possible is available to boards. It's routine practice in the NHS across the UK uh, because using digital means uh, helps to deliver results more quickly. It helps to deliver results in real time uh, and works to benefit patients who are most in need of NHS services. Now, this is not something uh, that is simply happening in Scotland. Uh, for example, radiology reporting online is a joint venture between University College London Hospitals Foundation, Trust and Imaging Partners Online, which is a company based in Sydney. Uh, it exists to provide a rapid round-the-clock reporting system. You only have to go to the official journal of the European Union to see a number of NHS uh, trusts in England advertising for the provision of radiology uh, reporting services out with the UK. Uh, this is a way in which uh, these scans are processed in order to speed up the process uh, and maximise the use of capacity here. It is a perfectly normal process and I'm sure the Health Secretary uh, would be happy to provide even more information to the member uh, to inform her views on this further. Question number six, Ian Gray. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to calls at the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association conference for the proposed education bill to be shelved. First Minister. Well, I think teachers in Scottish schools, whether in primary or secondary, share our ambition to improve uh, the education and life chances of our children and young people, and I hope that ambition is shared across the Parliament. Our reform proposals aim to empower teachers to make the decisions which most affect the education of pupils in their schools and to support them with advice and expertise through regional improvement collaboratives. Uh, we're listening carefully to the views expressed by a wide range of stakeholders, including the SSTA, as we finalise uh, our proposals. And uh, our proposals, of course, will be finalised in the near future. Ian Gray. Uh, well, the First Minister doesn't have to listen too hard to the SSTA. This wasn't a close conference vote. The demand to halt the education bill was unanimous. In fact, the only person at SSTA conference backing Mr Swinney's bill was Mr Swinney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps if the First Minister got out a bit more and spoke to teachers and to parents, she'd know that they agree with the SSTA that this bill is unnecessary and unwanted. When it comes to our schools, why does the First Minister think everyone is out of step except her and her Education Secretary? First Minister. Well, on, the, on the theme which seems to be recurring today of getting out a bit more, when I was uh, chairing a public question and answer session with the whole Cabinet in Glasgow on Monday, I was talking to some teachers. They were enthusing about the Pupil Equity Fund and the transformative effect of that in their schools. Our reforms 
Our reforms are unashamedly about empowering our frontline teachers, about getting more resources into the hands of our frontline teachers so they can make the decisions about how they invest those resources to raise standards in our schools. And, you know, with Labour, we hear repeatedly in this chamber, not just in education, but across a whole range of things, we hear repeatedly what Labour's against. We hear repeatedly what Labour opposes. Why don't we hear more about what Labour actually proposes to raise standards in our schools? We will continue to take forward bold, ambitious reforms in our schools because raising standards in education is our priority and we are prepared to do something about it, unlike Labour. Liz Smith. Uh, does the First Minister accept that one of the main concerns about the new bill is the apparent contradiction about allowing teachers to have greater control, yet imposing a central regional set of collaboratives on top of it. Will she address that matter when the new bill comes to Parliament? First Minister. Uh, no, I don't uh, accept that. The, the purpose of the regional improvement collaboratives is to provide best practice, advice and expertise to teachers so that they can use that uh, in their own practice in classrooms. I think that is a perfectly sensible uh, way to proceed. And uh, obviously, uh, some of the advice we take on, on these reforms comes from our uh, Council of International Education uh, advisors and the importance of best practice in our schools has been a recurring theme of some of the discussions there. Uh, so we will continue uh, to pursue the reforms that are going to make a difference in our education system. And of course, we are getting to a point here because repeatedly uh, and quite rightly, let me say for uh, clarity, presiding officer, opposition parties challenge the government to do more about standards in our schools. But we're getting to the point where we will find out whether the opposition are actually prepared to back us when it comes to doing the tough stuff that is required to achieve that, or whether they're going to just continue to shout from the sidelines. Question number seven, Jenny Mara. Ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the vision of Scottish swimming, everyone can swim. First Minister. Uh, we support the vision of Scottish swimming. We are committed to increasing engagement in sport and physical activity. Uh, swimming is a great way of keeping active. We invest in Scottish swimming, for example, with over 1.3 million provided through Sports Scotland last year. Scottish swimming supports a range of activity to increase participation in swimming and improve delivery of swimming lessons. I also welcome the partnership announced last year between Scottish swimming and Scottish water, which will help more than 100,000 children across Scotland to swim over the next two years. It's very strange because in Dundee, swimming has been cut for all primary school pupils, which, and I'll tell her what Labour is for, Labour is for swimming lessons for all primary school children across Scotland. The SNP have managed to make a political dog's breakfast of this. They tell head teachers to raid the pupil equity fund to mitigate these cuts. John Swinney then says that's not on. Council leader for the SNP blames press officers for getting that wrong when primary head teachers minutes explicitly say that swimming has been cut for all primary schools in Dundee. So what? Is the First Minister going to do about the ridiculous policy of cutting swimming on top of PE teachers and music teachers in school? Because the reality is, First Minister, that you and I had more opportunities at school under Thatcher than school children in Scotland have under your negligent government. First Minister. First Minister, order please. Well, let me. I'm glad to hear that Jenny Mary is confirming the Labour admiration for Margaret Thatcher. We've long, we've long suspected it, but now, now there's no hiding place. Let me first deal. Let me deal firstly with Dundee, and then perhaps come back to the question of Labour's position on these things. In terms of Dundee, we have received assurances from Dundee City Council there are no cuts to funding for swimming lessons in schools. The Deputy First Minister has been clear that he would not uh, agree to pupil equity funding being used to replace existing uh, provision, and that's not just the case in Dundee, but across uh, Scotland. But there is at least one council in Scotland uh, that I know is uh, cutting funding for swimming lessons. And I, I have it here. North Lanarkshire Council, and I have the extract from the budget document here, Labour-controlled North Lanarkshire Council 
cut £164,000 from their budget uh, in the, the last year, ending swimming lessons for primary fives completely. So we will take no lessons from Jerry Mara or for Labour, even if they do admire Margaret Thatcher so much. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, thank you, presiding officer. Um, uh, swimming is not just an activity, it, it's a life skill, and yet 40% of Scotland's children go to secondary school unable to do so. First Minister, your government withdrew £1.7 million worth of funding specifically allocated to ensure that all primary school pupils got the opportunity to learn. This means that for many, the ability to learn to swim, to be included in an activity which speaks to the health and well-being of our children, so prevalent in recent discussions in this place, will depend on an ability to pay for those lessons. Does the First Minister not recognise that by not denying access to swimming lessons for all, inequalities are being exacerbated and it detracts from the validity of any discussions her government are currently having around tackling childhood obesity? First Minister. The importance, the importance of tackling childhood abuse, uh, obesity, I think, is recognised uh, by all of us and we have uh, very recently set a very bold target around uh, doing uh, just that. Swimming as part of a broader physical activity programme is extremely important. That is why we continue to fund Scottish swimming. It's why we're delivering uh, real terms increases for council resource budgets this year. It's why we are uh, giving uh, pupil equity funding to head teachers across Scotland so they can decide what is best uh, for uh, young people. But I have to say, I have to say to, to Brian Whittle, uh, when he talks about funding for these things, uh, you know, we do have to reflect on the fact that if we had followed the advice of the Scottish Conservatives yeah. when we set our last budget, we would have had more than £500 million less to allocate in that budget uh, than is the case just now. Because they wanted to give tax cuts to the richest rather than fund local authority services. And I'm really glad, and I think people across Scotland will be really glad that we did not follow that advice. Thank you, and that concludes First, First Minister's questions. We're going to move on to members' business in the name of Mary Fee on uh, celebrating Gypsy Travellers. However, we're going to have a short suspension for a few moments, just so the gallery can clear and the next debate can start. So a short suspension. <laughs>